welcome to World News and in Indian Perspective on All India Radio. This is Renuka and with me is R.S. Raghu bringing glimpses of the major developments of the day from across the globe. Over the next half an hour, we shall bring to you the latest from the world of politics, economy, sports, entertainment and more. The Headlines First meeting of G20 Joint Finance and Health Task Force concludes successfully. India's G20 Sherpa Amitabh Khan says New Delhi aims to emerge as bridge between developed and developing states for enhanced cooperation. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi calls upon members of parliament to make the International Year of Millets 2023 a mass movement. Indian Navy receives fifth indigenously built Scorpion class submarine Bagheer. India to focus on genome sequencing of positive samples amid rise in covid cases in China, Japan and the United States. Chinese citizens express doubts over low covid death figures as demand for cremation surges. In Thailand, rescuers race against time to find missing navy sailors after warship capsizes due to storm. Bank of Japan shocks global markets with yield control policy change. The first joint finance and health task force JFHTF meeting under India's G20 presidency was held in virtual mode on Tuesday. The meeting was attended by finance and health representatives from G20 and invited countries as well as international organizations. The meeting was co-chaired by Italy and Indonesia. The Bali Leaders Declaration 2022 extended the mandate of the task force to continue the collaborations between finance and health ministries for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. The first JFHTF enabled discussions on the mandates specified by the Bali Leaders Declaration. The task force secretariat worked with the Indian presidency and co-chairs Italy and Indonesia to draft the work plan for next year and beyond which was designed around Indian presidency's global health priorities for 2023. The work plan was presented for adoption during the meeting. The members expressed commitment to the task force's mandate of contributing to strengthening global health architecture for pandemic prevention, preparedness and response and working with the secretariat and the co-chairs on achieving the deliverables for next year. G20 Sherpa Amitabh Kant has said that India's G20 presidency will aim to be inclusive, ambitious, decisive and action oriented. He said the essence of India's presidency can also be found in the idea of one world, one family and one future, highlighting the need for collective action and unified goals. Mr. Kant made these remarks in an article written by him in the Mann ki Baat booklet of November 2022 edition titled The Path Ahead Inter and G20. He said that the presidency of G20, a group that accounts for 85% of the world's GDP, has always been a position of greater honor and greater responsibility. He said that India will look to emerge as a bridge between the developed and developing states for enhanced cooperation. He added that it brings with it the chance to turn challenges into opportunities, especially in areas where national and international efforts amalgamate. Mr. Kant wrote that Mission Life, Lifestyle for Environment Financing for SDGs, Green Energy Transitions, Food Security and Ensuring Reliable Supply Chains for Food and Energy and Digital Transformation will be the India's key priority areas in the presidency of G20. The Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs is organizing the Urban 20 event as part of the G20 presidency of India. The event started on December 1st and will go on till November 30th next year. Urban 20, one of the engagement groups of G20, provides a platform for cities from G20 countries to facilitate discussions on various important issues of urban development including climate change, social inclusion, sustainable mobility, affordable housing and financing of urban infrastructure and proposed collective solutions. As part of the Urban 20 event, Gujarat CM Bhupendra Patel unveiled the logo, website and social media handles of Urban 20 on December 19th. Union Minister for Housing and Urban Affairs Hardeep Singh Puri joined the event virtually. 
He said that Urban 20 is a part of city diplomacy as cities are the powerhouse that drives global economic growth. Under the G20 Presidency of India, Ahmedabad, a UNESCO World Heritage City will host the U20 cycle. Along with Climate 40, C40 and United Cities and Local Governments, UCLG, two international non-governmental advocacy groups on urban issues, Ahmedabad will organize various events including City Sherpas' inception meeting on February 9th to 10th, thematic discussions and side events on urban development issues culminating with U20 Mayor's Summit in July 2023. The first Shepa meeting of the Urban 20 event is scheduled to be held on February 9th to 10th. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi has called upon the members of the parliament to make the International Year of Millets 2023 a mass movement. Mr. Modi said this while addressing the BJP Parliamentary Party meeting in Parliament House Complex on Tuesday. Briefing the media after the meeting, Parliamentary Affairs Minister Pralhad Joshi quoted the Prime Minister as saying that he emphasized on two aspects. First, promotion of an ongoing nutrition campaign through millets and second, food items made from millets can be served to the guests who would attend the G20 meetings and events so that they can understand the importance of millets. He said, the Prime Minister stressed on the need for inclusion of millets in the diet of sports person. Prime Minister Modi, along with other leaders, attended the lunch in Parliament where millet dishes were served. In a tweet, the Prime Minister said it was good to see participation from across party lines. The Agriculture and Farmers Welfare Ministry is taking several steps in collaboration with all concerned to spread awareness about millets with the objective of increasing the demand and acceptance of millets. India's Atomic Energy and Space Minister Dr. Jitendra Singh has said that under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the Indian space sector is emerging as a major foreign exchange earner through the launch of a large number of foreign satellites. Dr. Singh informed that so far, India has launched 385 foreign satellites. Out of these satellites, 353 were launched in the last eight years, which is around 90% of all launches. He also informed that out of total 220 million euros earned by launch of foreign satellites, 187 million euros generated in the last eight years, which is around 85% of forex earned by launch of European satellites. In an interview to a channel, Dr. Jitendra Singh said, On new space policy, it is in the final stages as the Department of Space is in the process of establishing a predictable, forward-looking, enabling regulatory regime for space activities in the country through a comprehensive, well-defined policy for the entire gamut of such activities. The Indian Navy has received the fifth Scorpion submarine, Vagir, of Project 75 Calvary class submarines by Mazagon Dock Shipbuilders Limited, MDL Mumbai, on Tuesday. India's Ministry of Defence said the submarine would shortly be commissioned into the Navy and enhance its capability. Project 75 includes the indigenous construction of six submarines of Scorpion design. These submarines are being constructed in collaboration with France's Naval Group. Construction of these submarines in an Indian yard is another step towards self-reliant India and a notable achievement is that this is the third submarine delivered to the Navy in a span of 24 months. The Union government has asked states to increase genome sequencing of positive samples amid a rise in COVID cases in China, Japan, the United States, Korea and Brazil. India's Union Health Secretary Rajesh Bhushan has written a letter to all the Chief Secretaries and Secretaries of Health and States and UTs. Mr. Bhushan said this will enable the timely detection of newer variants, if any, circulating in the country. He said this will also facilitate the undertaking of requisite public health measures. He requested all the states to ensure that as far as possible, samples of all positive cases on a daily basis are sent to the designated genome sequencing laboratories. In India, around 1,200 cases are being reported on a weekly basis. Chinese netizens and various health experts have expressed doubts over China's low reporting of COVID-related deaths in recent days as hospitals across the country are overwhelmed with fewer patients and demand for cremation was rising at crematoriums and funeral homes. A number of COVID-related deaths have been reported in Chinese media in the recent days, but authorities have only reported seven deaths since the loosening of COVID protocols on December 7th. 
Long wait periods have been reported in Peking for cremation. In the absence of any official COVID case count, news about surging infections spread rapidly through social media and the same is happening with the COVID death count as well. As many netizens said they knew someone who died from COVID. Peaching authorities on Tuesday announced five more COVID-related deaths after two COVID-related deaths on Monday as the city has been hit by a surge in infections. But the true magnitude of the outbreak is beyond measure as the requirement for PCR testing for individuals has been dropped and no self-reporting mechanism is there for rapid antigen tests. Many models have predicted a death toll of about a million people in 2023. The United States on Monday expressed concern that toll of the virus is a global concern due to the size of the Chinese economy and it also might spawn new mutations of the virus. Meanwhile, China's National Health Commission on Tuesday clarified that only COVID-19 patients who die from respiratory, respiratory failure will be counted towards the official death toll. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on the first Joint Finance and Health Task Force meeting under India's G20 Presidency. In conversation are former Ambassador Anil Vadva and AIR correspondent S. Rangabashim. Mr. Vadva, a warm welcome to the program. Tell us about the genesis of this particular task force. So in uh, Rome in October 2021, the origin of this joint G20 finance and health ministers, they came up with a communique and this task force was formed at that point in time. The reason quite simply was that when they discussed what was happening around in the world with regard to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was quite clear that the severity and hospitalization of the affected patients had revealed weaknesses in the pandemic prevention, preparedness and response and also the health system and services, information and education. And also the pandemic had exposed significant shortcomings in the world's ability to coordinate a global health response. So there was a need to come up with some collaborative efforts to ensure that there's equitable access to safe and affordable quality effective vaccines, also personal protective equipment, particularly in low and middle income countries. There was also an effect on the resilience of supply chains and vaccine distribution and administration. So the leaders at that point decided that whatever has to be done in this regard has to be anchored in the country's needs and context and also recognizing the urgent need to act collectively to address the cross-border nature of health emergencies. Uh, therefore, the work of this G20 informal group of finance and experts was uh, in focus, and this task force was aimed at enhancing dialogue and also global cooperation on issues relating to the pandemic, promoting the exchange of experiences and best practices, and developing some coordination arrangements between finance and health ministries of countries so that there is a collective action which is promoted, which addressed the health emergencies with cross-border impact. So that is how we've seen this uh, task force, you know, developing forward, developing options for coordination arrangements. And now we are seeing fruition of that in the form of the first meeting of uh, this task force under India's presidency uh, mm. here in India, which is in the virtual mode. Mr. Vadva, in the post-COVID era, maybe before COVID, you know, there was a couple of countries who wanted to, you know, kind of insulate themselves, were not very forthcoming with, you know, cooperating with other countries on the on the health front. But in the post-COVID era, I think all the countries have probably come on the same page. And they do acknowledge the fact that, you know, we have to prevent and we have to be prepared for these emergencies. And also our, our responses should be kind of global in nature, should be kind of, you know, combined and joint in nature, isn't it? That's absolutely correct, because I think there's a big realization that unless everyone acts together and identifies the problems together and finds the solutions together and at the same time coordinates and finances and mobilizes resources for pandemic prevention, it would not work. The whole effort will not work. In fact, our own foreign minister, Mr. Mandvia, when a G20 joint finance and health ministers meeting was held in 2021 in October, that's the time he pointed out that we have, of course, importance of international health regulations which has been brought to the fore 
and also the need for strengthening global health governance. But how does one go about it? Because currently, there are several parallel proposals being discussed in multiple fora. So it's, for example, the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response. Then there is the International Health Regulation Review, which is ongoing. There's also a need for a framework or a convention, an instrument of that kind for pandemic management. And plus there's a G20 proposal, which we are discussing right now, which is the Joint Health and Financial Task Force to strengthen the pandemic preparedness and response. So India has always said that we should have a central role for the WHO in this area and that the multiple entities with overlapping mandates, uh, while they're delving on this issue of pandemic preparedness and response, they must have a clearly defined complementarity in all their initiatives so that, you know, it's woven seamlessly to create a global health emergency management architecture. And that precisely is the need of the hour. Also, we see that there are multiple stakeholder mechanisms which have developed, like Global Alliance for Vaccine Immunization. There's also Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness, for instance, or Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. And all these have a specific focus on affordable and equitable access. But no one is safe until everyone is safe, and everyone's development depends on trust and support of everyone else. So that should be the motto to develop a common approach to this problem. Mr. Vardza, in the the last one week or 10 days, you know, there have been reports that there is some kind of resurgence of of COVID in China. And and there are projections that uh, in the new year, that is 2023, you know, we could probably end up having a grim situation and China could probably have two or three COVID waves with huge, you know, mortality, which has been, you know, projected. So doesn't that uh, kind of impinge and give a sense of urgency to this entire debate and cooperation so that even in the in the near future also if something happens, the world gives a befitting reply and is kind of ready with its you know structure in place to handle and to give a appropriate response to that kind of a situation. You are absolutely right. What is happening in China today is quite worrisome and the projections are quite far-reaching projections, in fact, very grim. You know, what can happen, of course, is not limited to China because as we saw the last time around in the initial wave of the pandemic, we saw the travels from China not stopping and therefore the world started facing the onslaught, being quite unprepared at that point in time. But fortunately, there's a big difference this time in which, you know, one can see that not only is China prepared, but also it has uh, stepped up its vaccination, although there are clearly reports uh, which state that the vaccination program in China has not worked so well because of the efficacy of the vaccines. But that's a debatable point. Secondly, there's been a sudden reversal of policies from zero COVID policies to opening up and removing all mandatory testing in major areas. So surely and slowly, if not very rapidly, this issue can resurface again in the rest of the parts of the world because we are all interconnected, at least economically nowadays. And uh, the world needs to realize this, and that is why, fortunately, down the line, in two, three years down the line, there is much more of a sense of realization that uh, coordinated efforts would be required to tackle this issue. Because of the various waves that the European countries, United States, and Asia itself has gone through in the past, obviously the local immunization programs have developed quite a bit. A majority of the population seems vaccinated. You know, if you leave aside countries in Africa and Caribbean and Latin America, yeah. most other parts of the world have been fairly well inoculated. But at the same time, COVID has new variants all the time. And uh, when that happens, there is an immediate response which is required from a central agency. And India has always been saying that that central agency has to be the WHO, WHO. uh, which coordinates all the parallel frameworks that are now undertaking research and work in this area. Mr. Vada, you're talking about immunization early in the phase of pandemic when the vaccine was under development or uh, at the time when it was just developed and production had started off. You know, in India, we started uh, having a massive campaign for vaccination under the leadership of uh, Prime Minister Modi. Even at that particular point in time, India, you know, having its said principles of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, Prime Minister Modi made it very clear that despite the fact that we need, you know, millions of doses of the vaccine ourselves, 
still at that particular point in time government of india opened up uh, exports to other countries to help the member countries as well so india showed that kind of magnanimity in times to come can we expect the same magnanimity from other member countries also whether it is pharmaceuticals or development of you know another set of vaccines can we expect all that cooperation and magnanimity from other members also we have seen how much india is prepared to give to the outside world we have a proven track record as you very rightly pointed out and that policy will continue going forward in fact um, india and some other brics countries especially south africa or brazil for that matter have taken the lead in who in trying to look at waivers of ipr patents etc and also making sure that vaccines are available at affordable prices in different parts of the world so in that process india is not at all shy of sharing its technology of opening up its uh, vaccine expertise to the rest of the world but the question remains how much big pharma as we call it in the developed countries is willing to share that with the poorer countries of what we call the global south and uh, that's the main reason why pressure on their governments is such that there's been still no consensus on uh, sharing that and also making sure that the ipr restrictions are lifted not only manufacturing of vaccines but also in terms of equipment which india has been pushing for in wto and of course in the who so it remains still remains to be seen how much cooperation we will see going forward from the past experience it doesn't seem likely that the big pharma companies will entirely open up to the outside world unless there is a change of heart and there is a pressure from their respective governments mr vadva on that optimistic note uh, let's wind up this discussion thank you so much for joining us In Thailand, a rescue operation is underway on the second day on Tuesday in the search of sailors who are still missing after a Thai ship warship HTMS Sukhothai sank on Sunday night due to a storm. A Navy commander had earlier said that the rescue team had only a two-day window to find anyone alive in the ocean. The warship had 105 crew, out of which 29 are still missing. Rescuers are combing the Gulf of Thailand in search of sailors. As many as 76 sailors have been saved so far, the Thai Navy is yet to disclose any fatalities. The Bank of Japan shocked markets Tuesday morning by adjusting its central bank's yield curve control program and sparking a sharp rise in the yen. According to the policy statement, Bank of Japan will now allow Japan's 10-year bond yields to rise to around 0.5%, up from the previous upper limit of 0.25% on their range of movement as part of fine-tuning measures to address the cost of prolonged monetary easing. It also decided to sharply increase the amount of government bond buying. It kept unchanged its minus 0.1% target for short-term interest rates and 0% for the 10-year government bond yield by a unanimous vote. The surprise decision has the potential to jolt global financial markets as the Bank of Japan's steadfast commitment to defending its 10-year yield cap has served as an anchor in directly helping to keep borrowing costs low around the world. The yen strengthened to as much as 133.21 yen against the dollar compared with 137.16 yen immediately before the announcement. And now a report from the business desk. The Sensex fell 104 points to settle at 61,702. The Nifty also slipped 35 points to finish at 18,385. Asian stocks locked losses amid overnight fall in US stocks. Japan's Nikkei 225 declined 2.5%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng fell 1.3%. China's Shanghai Composite Index ended 1.1% down. South Korea's Kospi slipped 0.8%, while Singapore's Straits Times Index closed marginally down by 0.1%. European shares were also down in intraday trade. Oil prices rose supported by a softer dollar, but gains were capped by uncertainty over the impact of rising COVID-19 cases in China. In intraday trade, Brent crude was trading at $80.20 per barrel. S. Rangabashiam for World News. Moving on to sports in women's cricket India suffered 54 run defeat to Australia in their fifth and final T20 international at the Brabourne Stadium in Mumbai on Tuesday put into bat first 
The visitors posted a huge 196 run target for the loss of four wickets in the stipulated 20 overs. Chasing the target, India were bundled out for 142 runs in 20 overs. With the result, Australia backed the series 4-1. In the United Kingdom, massive strikes by nurses are creating chaos in hospitals and standstills in transit hubs. The walkouts by firefighters, baggage handlers, paramedics, driving examiners, immigration officers, bus drivers, construction workers, mail carriers, and railway conductors have increased in the last few days. The authorities have warned the public to avoid train travels on Christmas Eve. According to reports, the British government is preparing to mobilize 1,200 army troops to drive ambulances over the holidays. The nurses who helped Britain overcome the worst years of the coronavirus pandemic are saying they need more than applause. They said they are burnt out, overworked, and underpaid. Tibetan spiritual leader Dalai Lama has said that there is no point in returning to China, and he prefers living in India, calling it his permanent home. While responding to a query over clash between India and China in Pyongyang, Dalai Lama said, "Generally speaking, things are improving in Europe, Africa, and also in Asia." He further said, "China is also becoming flexible now, but there is no point to return to China." Dalai Lama is scheduled to stay in Delhi for two to three days, and then he will go to Bodh Gaya in Bihar for spiritual teachings and other events. China and Russia will hold a joint naval military exercise from December 21 to 27 in East China Sea, off China's eastern coast, aiming to further deepen cooperation amid tense relations with U.S. over a range of issues. China's defense ministry said on Tuesday that the exercise, arranged according to annual plan between the two militaries, aims to demonstrate the ability of the two sides to jointly respond to maritime security threats. India has garnered international support for its coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure (CDRI). 31 nations and eight international organizations, including United Nations agencies, multilateral banks, and private sector partners, have supported Prime Minister Narendra Modi's CDRI proposal at the United Nations Climate Action Summit in New York in 2019. In a written reply in Parliament, India's Minister of State for Home Affairs, Nityanand Rai, said that the center has approved 480 crore rupees for a caucus to fund technical assistance and research projects. On an ongoing basis over a period of five years, ending in 2023-24. And now let's take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Straits Times writes: China's COVID-19 death report spread as doubts grow about official virus data. Guardian writes: Tunisian parliamentary election records just 8.8 percent turnout. The report said Tunisia has been plunged into political uncertainty following President Kais Saied's suspension of parliament and subsequent redrawing of the country's political map. The Washington Post reports UK nurses strike over pay, testing a healthcare system in crisis. The New York Times writes: Release of Trump tax returns could herald new era for taxpayer privacy. The Global Times writes Australia's FM to kick off visit to China in ice-breaking diplomatic activity. Wall Street Journal writes the European Energy Ministries agree to natural gas price cap. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. First meeting of G20 Joint Finance and Health Task Force concludes successfully. India's G20 Sherpa Amitabh Khan says New Delhi aims to emerge as bridge between developed and developing states for enhanced cooperation. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi calls upon members of Parliament to make the International Year of Millet 2023 a mass movement. Indian Navy receives fifth indigenously built Scorpion class submarine Bagheer. India to focus on genome sequencing of positive samples amid rise in COVID cases in China, Japan, and the United States. Chinese citizens express doubts over low COVID death figures as demand for cremation surges. In Thailand, rescuers race against time to find missing Navy sailors after warship capsizes due to storm. Bank of Japan shocks global markets with yield control policy change. And now, before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan, Vaishnava Jan, by Artis from Algeria.
And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.